Hi, Bill Hansbury here. Wonderful to be doing a talk for LDA. Today, um, I'm going to look at what we can do to unbreak the hearts of dyslexic kids while we're doing the multisensory uh, remediation program with them. Um, our kids come often fairly damaged to us, particularly if they're a bit older. So there's a there's a huge academic therapy component which goes along knowing our goes on goes alongside us knowing our stuff and 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 how to remediate these kids. So a big part of this is being able to explain to the kids why we ask them to do what we ask them to do. So there's a huge educational component to this. So a little bit of background on me. I'm a school teacher by trade, I guess, uh, and have spent the last 15 years working with kids with specific learning difficulties, dyslexia being one of them. Uh, I'm the co-author of the Dyslexia Solutions, the Playberry Dyslexia Solutions Program, which is a tier three program that Alison Playford and I developed. That's Alison holding up the, the champagne and myself next to her on the right side of the picture. And the other people in that picture there are Tiffany Stewart or Tiffany Linky, who did our um, design for us. Um, Sally Andrew, who trains alongside me in the Teaching Students with Dyslexia training, where we teach people to use the, um, the Playberry program. And Annette Brock uh, on the far right. And Annette and Alison are like the matriarchs of uh, teaching people how to teach dyslexic students in uh, not only South Australia, but Australia. Uh, Annette, Annette was a clinical psychologist for many years. So let's get into it. So um, look, just a quick plug. Um, Sally Andrew and I uh, have developed a product uh, or a set of products called the Word Cracker. Uh, and our next training uh, is in, Feb in Adelaide in February. So my website has more about the Word Cracking training and the Word Cracker, which is a, a resource to teach morphology. So you're probably familiar with, familiar with the first RTI, Response to Intervention. Well, um, those of you who work the way that I work are probably a bit used to the whole resistance to intervention, intervention thing too that we get from some of our kids. So why are kids, why do kids resist, resist intervention? Well, a lot of our kids come to us deciding or have decided that they're stupid. And that often happens because people have uh, forged forwards with uh, interventions that vary in quality, I'm sure, but have not explained dyslexia to them. And our kids need dyslexia explained to them well. Um, some of our kids have failed interventions up until now. So that could be because the school's not followed the science, have you, has used a non-evidence-based intervention, or staff using that intervention just haven't been trained well enough to use it effectively. Um, some of our kids have had adults over-promise and under-deliver when it comes to intervention. And again, it tends to come back to the same issues. It's the, the wrong type of program and or people not knowing really how to drive it. Um, there's a lot on attribution theory with students with dyslexia and a lot of our kids when they have some success will automatically attribute that to luck and not hard work. So some of our kids need to be taught that when you do the hard work and you're being taught the right, right way, you start to get success and that success is because of effort. So we need to teach our kids to attribute their successes to the hard work they're putting in. And then some of our kids have felt blamed for their difficulties. Um, you know, well-meaning teachers getting frustrated with our kids, well-meaning well parents getting frustrated with our kids when they read. So not understanding how dyslexia affects, uh, affects and impairs our kids when it comes to print. Um, I see some kids that have just been sooked over by parents and sometimes teachers. Um, and we'll talk more about that later in the developing the resilience our kids need. But these kids, if they've been, um, if life's, if parents and teachers have, have not done the hard yards on teaching these kids to work hard, then some of our kids develop, depending on the personality, will develop a sulky, low resilience way of doing things. You'd be very interested, I'm sure, to have a look at Alfred Adler's Four Goals of Misbehaviour. And a lot of our kids are right down at the bottom at displays of, displays of inadequacy. So they, they decided they can't, no one can help them, and no matter what we do, they'll always be useless. Some of our kids just have really severe dyslexia and have decided because of that life's not fair. Not fair. And these kids do need adults who know what they're doing around them to keep re-explaining the difficulties, why the work's worth it, um, and just to keep them buoyant whilst you know the intervention grinds on slowly for them. 
some of our kids come out of schools who have a pretty poor culture around intervention, usually schools that haven't got withdrawal intervention. Um, so when kids go and have an intervention, finally, you know, the, there's a whole heap of stigma around it. Whereas schools that do this really well and interventions part of the, of the, uh, the furniture, no one blinks an eye, an eyelid at this. And what our kids have in common is they are deeply discouraged, a lot of them, and they're really ashamed. Uh, of the difficulty, so that's almost a given. So understanding how to work with kids and, and their feelings of shame and inadequacy are really important. Um, we need to assume, and I assume, that, uh, that kids that come to me have a huge knowledge gap about dyslexia. Sure, parents have tried to explain it to them, um, but it is our job as someone who the kids will listen to because we're not mum or dad or whoever who, who, you know, who they think it's their job to pump them up, it's our job to explain to them uh, in the very beginning and in an ongoing way what dyslexia is, how it's going to affect them. Um, because if we don't do this education I'm going to talk about in this training, we create a vacuum. And no matter how good our intervention is, if we're not continually reminding kids about how dyslexia affects them, how it's not their fault and why they need to do the work we ask them to, that vacuum is very quickly again filled by self-blame and self-pity. Uh, and then, not for all kids, but for some, and then we've got a problem. So in the beginning, one of the things I think it's important to say to, to youngsters with dyslexia, and Mark LeMessurier taught me this, is you just look at them and you grin and you go, well, listen, you're going to have to make up your mind. You're either dumb or you're dyslexic because from a clinical perspective, you can't be both at the same time. Um, dumb people can't be diagnosed with dyslexia because it is an unexpected difficulty with someone who's otherwise pretty clever. Um, and kids grin at me when I do this, and it's fairly blunt using the words dumb, but a bit of humour helps. And, uh, and it's just the starting of cracking that shell that, hey, you're not stupid, you're dyslexic, because by the way, you can't be both. Um, our kids will often have mums tell them that they're smart, and of course they're smart, because they're, they're dyslexic and they're not dumb. Um, but we also need to acknowledge with our kids that school is hard. And this is a, a help, helpful um, diagram from Sally Shaywitz that what you might show to kids, bigger ones, that shows them they have all of these strengths, so you, they have this sea of strengths around a difficulty with print and a difficulty with decoding. And we start to talk to, talk to our kids straight away about decoding because that's what we want them to do when they can't read a word. I have a, a funny old meme that says, keep calm and decode for, because guessing is for chumps. Uh, and I've got you know, stickers for those to give to my kids when they start, and they, they kind of enjoy it, you know. They, we teach them straight away to sound out when they may have learned to guess in other areas. But anyway, it's worth showing kids something like this to show them that they've got all of these strengths in how their brain works around a weakness when it comes to speech sounds in words. Some of our kids rock up with an assessment from an ed psych, and we all know that the quality, the quality of these assessments can vary um, because some some, eds, some psychologists are really across specific learning difficulties and some just aren't. But if your child, if, if a new client comes to you with an assessment and the psychologist has used the WISC, which a lot of them do, you'll be able to see at their subs, you'll be able to look at their sub scores across the primary index scales. Um, and what I do with my kids is I have a look at their assessment first, and I've had many years of practice doing this, and you point out their subtest scores and I'll say to a youngster look you might, you might remember of you know you might remember when a psychologist gave you num lists of numbers to remember they were actually checking your working memory and that's one of the weaknesses remembering things that you've heard is a weakness for dyslexia so I go through the kids sub uh, subtest scores with them and I explain what a percentile is because those scores in their assessments will be percentiles and and the purpose of the whole exercise is to show them that they've got areas of strength um, but also areas of weakness. But our kids will have um, usually average-ish scores across a lot of those subtests. Some of our kids, particularly our twice exceptional kids, will have really high scores in things like verbal comprehension and, and visual, spatial and fluid reasoning. And in the new WISC, the visual, spatial and the fluid reasoning go together to make what we used to call, I think, the processing speed index. But so you, they're, on the, they're on the screen is what I say to kids. I say, look, if I sat you in a room with 100 kids picked from all over the world of your age and gave them these tests and say a kid got 50th percentile, I'll go, you would have been, there would have been um, half the kids that did better than you and half the kids that did worse than you. So our kids start to gain an idea that um, they do have strengths and the dyslexia doesn't completely 
dominate their cognitive profile. It's just an isolated cluster of difficulties, which, by the way, makes school really hard. So we're using their WISC results to point out islands of competence for them. You won't do that for all kids, um, but I, I, I tend to be able to explain it. I've had enough practice to, to explain it to most kids. There's also the good old simple view of reading from Gotham Tumner, which I've used with some of my other kids to explain to them where dyslexia sits. So, you know, with language comprehension, I'll say, now listen, dyslexic people get language, right? If you and I are talking, you understand exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you get words, you've got words, you've got a good bank of words in your head, so you've got a good vocabulary. So if I explain something to you, no worries. And you could probably explain something to me because you've got lots of words and you've got good words. So that's language comprehension. So we'll explain to our kids, look, you're quite high there. But then we talk about the stuff of reading words you don't know. And that's the decoding or the word recognition. So it's good to use this model to explain to kids where dyslexia sits on a continuum of, of being able to work with language uh, and being able to read words that you don't know. Um, so this is another option you can use. I, I explain this to adults all the time, um, but you can do it with some kids as well. So again, they, they see dyslexia as a corner of difficulties or an island of difficulties in a sea of strengths. And then we've just got the fact that English is a shocker of an orthography. So what you're seeing is a, a bit of my spelling, uh, my um, some rules for, for some spelling rules, rules worth remembering infographic. And it's important kids understand that English is, is a setup where there are 26 letters. And I'll say to kids how many letters in the alphabet, and they don't all know them, so we'll count them, we'll go 26. And I'll say, hey, listen, do you know how many sounds make up the words that we use in English? And nobody knows unless they've been told. And they'll go, well, it's about 44. And you'll go to kids, can you see the problem here? We've got 26 letters that have to go together in all sorts of different ways to spell 44 sounds. I go, hey, listen, if you're, dys if you're, dys well, you're dyslexic, but if you were Italian, your dyslexia wouldn't be affecting you in, in any uh, kind of way that it's affecting you in English because the Italian alphabet has the same number of letters and the same number of sounds. So we don't have this dodgy setup in Italian where we've got to, you know, for, for instance, we've got to um, put letters together in weird combinations to spell sounds like th, like in thing. They've just got one symbol for one sound uh, all the way through and it makes it that, you know, dyslexia won't affect you as much in an English, in, in, a, in an orthography like Italian. And also, you notice I start to use terms with kids like phonology and orthography straight away because these are terms that our kids need to understand because as they get further up in, the, in a program like Playberry, we need to be able to use that meta language to explain why we do what we do. Um, when our kids start learning irregular words, you know, all irregular words have a phonological component, which means they have some letters that match up beautifully to the, to the sounds, but also sometimes there's an irregular part. So that's where orthography comes in. So we'll talk to kids about those things. So, oh yes, there we go. I was ahead of myself. So yeah, count the letters in the alphabet with them and ask them how many sounds they know. And then you've got a conversation using an infographic like this. You've got a conversation about how English is tough. Uh, I use this one with adults and sometimes with kids, um, you know, just, just making the point that uh, English is a difficult orthography and you know dyslexia is hard enough in a sound based alphabet that if it's English or French it's going to be tougher. Um, now our kids are bright so the next question they might ask is well why is English so tricky? Why do we have weird setups where we've had to put together weird letters in combinations to make sounds that we don't have a letter for in the alphabet? And there's a great little bit of history here that, that, that explains this and, and the fact is that uh, what is now England was, was once made up of lots of kind of roaming tribes and groups of people and not always roaming, sometimes quite settled, but England was invaded over and over again by, uh, you know, by lots of people coming across the channel or coming down or up. Um, and what happens is every time these groups were invaded by different invading groups, in came different pieces of language. So English has ended up a, a blob um, just a massive blob of other languages that, by the way, continues to evolve. 
Um, and the help in the invention of the printing press also made it that we had to standardise English because once upon a time you could spell a word any way you liked, and as long as it was all fo as long as it was phonetically correct, no one cared. But then English had to be standardised when the printing press came along. So yeah, English is a bit of a mongrel of a language because it's got many many different breeds making it up. Uh, that's just a quick look at what my spelling rules infographic can look like in a school. Um, some it, It's best as a huge thing that kids can talk about, teachers can take them to, but it's also, I also sell it as posters starting at, say, size A1 and going up to AO. And this is another school in Victoria that decided to use it on a wall space. So it becomes a really good teaching tool. So um, phonological awareness is something that, or phon awareness, but I call it phonological awareness. It's something we've got to start talking to kids about straight away. And you can even start to do some uh, um, morphological work with kids and you teach them that the phon means sound or phone, phoneme, sound. So whenever they hear phon or phone, they think sound. So when we talk about phonological awareness, I, I teach my kids from even when they're quite young that we're going to do lots of sound work because the core difficulty of dyslexia the main difficulty in almost all people with dyslexia is the brain's not very good at taking words and chopping them apart into their sounds. So we can talk to kids about how this didn't matter when we didn't have a language that we wrote. But when we invented writing, we had to develop a system that uh, created a set of symbols that matched sounds. So again, there's a historical aspect of this that, uh, you know, and this stuff we do with them didn't matter until some jerk invented writing and, and writing was the game changer for people who had dyslexia because before writing was invented you could have dyslexia and no one knew and no, no one knew and no one cared so sometimes metaphors help and i use this with teachers i say to kids you know when you say words if i say to a youngster look if you said cat and then we if we recorded you and slowed down that recording and played it back we wouldn't hear k -a which is what phonics wants us to do, um, all we'd hear is something like crat. So um, it's worth telling older kids that words were never meant to be chopped into sounds. It's actually a weird invention that came along with writing. So um, the work we get to do, the uh, work we ask kids to do in the play very early on is this stuff we call phonological awareness, retraining their brain to be able to pull sounds out of the herd, the herd being a whole word, to pull phonemes out of the herd and be able to deal with it. Um, so it's worth talking to kids about what we're doing with them when we're doing phon awareness training. So um, I'm going to show you in a moment a quick clip um, of me doing some phon awareness work at Tier 3 uh, with kids that I work with in my own private practice, but you'll also see some teachers doing phon awareness work. Um, I used this when I did a, a, a talk for the um, South Australian Government uh, or Department for Education Literacy Guarantee Unit. So what I want you to watch here, I guess, is just how I talk to these lads, um, or in particular Big Matt, um, and maybe you'll pick some stuff up worth looking at around my um, my approach uh, with him. How are these going, mate? Looks like a few squiggly ticks. My, uh, your last effort's mainly normal ticks. Yeah. All right. Just for the audience, this is this is Kilpatrick's Equip for Reading Success um, one minute phonological awareness activities. So I use these with, with kids sometimes at the beginning instead of alphabet work. Uh, okay. Can you say arc? Arc. Instead of k, say ch. Arch. Good. Say bulk. Bulk. Instead of k, say b. Bulk. Bulk. Good. Say therm. Therm. Instead of m, mm, say d. Third. You're going all right, Maddie, with this. Yeah. So you realise you're swapping a consonant sound on the end? Yep. Yeah. Good. Say mart. Mart. Instead of t, say k. Mark. Good. Say elk. Elk. Instead of k, say s. Get elk on your fingers, mate. Going from that way to that way. Elk. Elk. Right. Instead of k, say s. Else. Else. Well done. Good use of the fingers. Say urn. Urn. Instead of n, say f. Er. Good. Say dark. Dark. Instead of k, say t. Dark. I once threw a dart at a mate's head accidentally and it got stuck in there. Anyway, it's just a story for you. 
so look i won't show you the rest of that just for time but um if you're interested you'll see more of that um at a training that i'm running with a colleague in march on march 12th so that was uh, me using Kilpatrick's, as the screen said, Kilpatrick's One Minute Activities. Um, a bit of humour never, ever goes astray with kids because you've got to remember humour is one of the best antidotes for shame. And our kids do feel shame when they have difficulty. You know, one of the beautiful things about a structured multisensory intervention is we don't ask them to do anything we haven't retaught them, but there are going to be times when it's hard. So... Another thing that uh, that I've done or learned to do over the years is to, you know, when I first get kids in and I'm taking them on as a as a student, uh, I'll take some bits from something a parent asked me to do with his daughter years and years ago. We called it Bill and Emily's Amazing Talk About Dyslexia. So our kids need to understand how dyslexia happens. So um, in my office, I've got a bundle of wires, uh, just electrical wires, which I call my brain, just to illustrate that the brain is basically a bunch of connections wired up in certain ways. And then I've also got, a, I've also got my squidgy brain that I think you might see later on. But um, I'll explain to kids that brains are, yeah, like a series of, of, of links of these funny things called neurons. And if you put a brain under a microscope and, and you know, and I magnified about 10,000 times or something like that, You'll see this type. This is, you'll see this type of thing, and I'll say, look, dyslexia is a difference in how the brain is wired up, the parts that do reading. And I also introduce kids I work with with to, to Sally and Bennett Shaywitz as if like like I know them. I've ne never met Sally or Bennett in my life, but they've been a big part of my learning journey. And I teach my kids that um, Sally and Bennett Shaywitz, as well as other reading researchers, have done a lot of sticking kids in. A machine like this which is an fmri machine or that might that might be a cat oh, anyway kids don't need to know but i'll say they've what they watched kids brains read so they gave kids a series of non-words to read and they wanted to see and they put thousands and thousands of kids into a machine kids that had into this machine kids that were with dyslexic and kids that weren't dyslexic and they wanted to take pictures of the brain while it reads and to see what was different between kids with dyslexia and kids who didn't have dyslexia and this is making, look, a neuropsychologist would just shoot me for this. But anyway, this is how I explain it to kids. Um, kids need to know that there are parts of their brain never built for reading. The brain is not set up for reading. It's set up to learn to talk. All you need to do is hang around people that talk and you'll learn to talk unless you have a language disorder. But there are no parts of the brain ready for reading. So what the brain has to do, it has to pick parts that were never built for reading and somehow set them up and wire them together so the job of reading can be done. And I show kids this diagram and I show them, look, this is the way the brain's pretty much rigged up for reading. It's decided to use these three areas with circles and it's had to connect these three areas up in really efficient ways. And in dyslexia, for some reason, these three areas haven't wired in an optimal way, haven't wired up in a really efficient way. So what's happened is the brain does the job of reading in a slower, harder way than a non-dyslexic brain does. And I explained to kids, this is nothing you've done wrong. This is this The way this wired up is the same way you got brown hair or blue eyes. It was determined in your genetics. So when you were growing in, in your mother's womb, your brain was setting up uh, and neurons didn't quite end up in the right place. So when reading was introduced to your brain, the way it organised itself while you were a little bubby in your mum's tummy uh, determined that your brain wouldn't use the most efficient pathways and connections for reading. But you can be taught. So this is why I ask you to do the things I ask you to do. We'll talk about that later because we are teaching your brain to move the job of reading and move the connections to, to areas that work better. For my older kids, I'll show them this highly more this slightly more sophisticated diagram and show them that a good intervention moves the job of reading over to that left side. Whereas if you are a little reader and you're just learning, uh, and you're not dyslexic, eventually the job moves over on its own. But if you're dyslexic for some reason, the job doesn't move over from the right to the left. So we need a good intervention um, and I need to teach you the way your brain needs to be taught to move the job over here. So our kids need to know that there are changes going on and, and in particular when they feel it's hard and it sucks and they want to give up and they're having a real struggle with a word, I say to them, that's when the brain's really doing the hard work of rewiring. 
It's worth explaining to kids that no brain wants to rewire. Once it thinks it's worked out how to do something, it wants to stick with what it knows. So we get a lot of yucky feelings when the brain's reorganising and rewiring. So that's why this stuff feels crappy, I guess, for lack of a better term. So we do need to say to our kids, look, you will learn to read. You may not be the fastest reader on earth, but we will get you a lot further than where you are now. And by the way, we'll get your spelling there as well. But it's going to take some time and it's going to it's going to be a slog. And for some kids, the slog is harder. But, you know, we'll, we'll get you there. So another thing that is really important for our kids alongside explaining to them what dyslexia is, um, explaining to them um, how it affects them, how it came to be in them, um, and that it's not their fault. In an ongoing way, when we're working with kids in intervention, there are a few things we'll probably have to reteach them. Now, when it comes to content, you know, anyone watching this who's done evidence-based intervention or multisensory intervention, you're across the stuff of repetition. Right, you have no problem with that. Our kids need multiple repetitions. That's why they do drills and that sort of thing. But they also need repetition when it comes to explaining to them why we ask them to do things the way they do. Because our kids get a gutful of having to um, verbalise all the time, uh, of having to use the editing strategies we teach them, to uh, using their cards and practising their cards at home. And one of the things that my kids or some of them can get a gutful of is the drill they have to do when I do what's called the spelling card drill with them. So the spelling card drill is... Um, where um, it's the opposite of the reading card drill and the spelling card drill. I've got on a set of cards all of the graphemes I've taught, sorry, all of the phonemes I've taught them, and I will say the phoneme, they will repeat the phoneme, then tell me which letters spell that phoneme all aloud and then write it down. And a lot of, a lot of my kids just don't want to do the whole thing. They go, oh, do I have to say it? I just want, I just want to write it down. So every now and then I've just got to stop and go, hey, listen, let me remind you why I'll get you to do this highly annoying stuff. So this is an example of me teaching some uh, lads about um, how this happens and why we do it the way we do it. Ways to spell I. I is I, I is I, consonant is E, and R and I is Y. Excellent. Um, B. B is B. Three ways to spell K. K is C, K is K. Oops. Not a gay. Not a gay. K is K. Yep. K is C. K. Okay. Now, I want to explain to you guys mm -hmm. why I insist on getting you to say the sound back to me, tell me which letter spells it, mm -hmm. and then write it all at once because kids hate it, right? They go, why do I have to say it and spell it? Mm -hmm. Right, so that's the brain. So what's going on? Yeah, it's, don't do that to your own brain. It's just never good. Okay, so lads, we do something called a, a multi-sensory drill. So when I when you're doing just what you're doing there, um, Zach, and I will say the sound and you will say the sound back to me and then tell me which letter spells it, what we're doing is using a, a number of your senses. You're hearing the sound, right? So I'll say three ways to spell k, and then you'll say... Is C, k, is K... And what's your hand doing while you're doing that? Um, writing. Beautiful. Now, there's this, there's this beautiful saying among people who study the brain, and this is it here. Neurons, which are fancy brain cells, neurons that fire together. Wire together. Right, they wire together. So basically, to put, to put a complex thing really simply, is if you are using two sets of neurons at the very same time, and they're both firing, they eventually over time learn to hook up with each other, right? So when we're doing this here, now I don't know exactly where handwriting happens in the brain. Kind of involves some of the motor cortex and uh, as I just found, the cingulate gyrus I think is a bit to do with it. Typical brain stuff, there's never one part of the brain that does one job, it gets shared. But let's just say handwriting happens there. Put your finger there, Jake. Let's just say it was one area. So when you're forming a letter, you're you're also saying for for k, you're saying k is k is, k is c k is k, k is c. K. Now let's pretend that your brain stores the sounds of letters there. So put your finger there. Okay, so sounds of letters. Let's just say they're stored there, but we know they're stored in many places. 
Jake, you got your finger where um, the program for writing letters is stored, you know, with a program that tells your hand what to do. And let's just say that the sounds for letters are stored there. So you've got these different regions all working at once because you're having to do all these jobs. You're finding the sound. You're finding the name of the letter or the name of the letters, in that case, C, K and C, K. Yeah. And what else are you doing? You're saying it. What else are you doing? You're looking at it. Alt, so you're actually using your stored image of what it looks like as well. But now have a look where our fingers are, all over the shop. Mm. We are actually firing a whole heap of different neurons at once, aren't we? So if they start firing together, boys, what does your brain learn to do when neurons fire together? Oh, they wire together? Yeah, so they, they create a network. So mm -hmm. it becomes automatic. And that network is really important. That's why we call this stuff multi-sensory learning, because if you use all of those senses, movement, mouth movement, hearing, sound, vision, sight, all that sort of stuff at once, um, you remember better. Mm. All right, boys, there you go. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing that, everyone. Uh, by the way, this is Zach. This is Jake. He has a CK after a short vowel in his name, and he has an A consonant E, and they're both smart boys. They're both fart smellers. Oh, I mean smart fellas. Okay, so um, those boys were nice enough to indulge me because I said, hey, lads, could you help me? I've got to record something for, uh, for, for me teaching some teachers about this stuff, and they were happy to do it. You probably saw Zach look at his watch because the next thing that was going to happen, it happened to be the last session of the year, and they were keen for me to take them down to KFC and buy them some, uh, some nuggets because that's how we celebrate the end of the year. So they, bless them, they uh, suffered me. Okay, so you might have got some language in there about understand, helping kids understand why they have to do it, this whole say it, write it, hear it, see it routine or, or any kind of multi-sensory Julia asked them to do. Um, this is another really important model. Now, this is Ebbinghaus's, forget, Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. Now, I don't teach kids this usually until they hit the Playberry, part of the Playberry program where we start what we call the awkward squad, which is um, a process called the eight-step multisensory process where I teach kids an effective way to learn words with irregular spellings. So, and the reason I teach them the um, forgetting curve there is because... Um, Again, we've got to reinforce the importance of coming back and revising, even though they've been revising the whole time they've been in the program with me. So Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. Now, because it's a graph, you'll teach older kids this. Kids need to have a concept of what a graph is, so they know what they're looking at before you teach them what the forgetting curve is all about. But if you Google um, forgetting curve, you'll find uh, videos all over YouTube about it and really good images like this. So basically, it just shows kids, if you don't revise something, um, you will run, you'll ride the forgetting curve down because the brain is built to forget stuff that you don't rehearse. The only way we teach our brain to take something from short-term memory or the fridge and pop it into long-term memory, which we call the freezer, which is a nice metaphor for kids because stuff doesn't go off in the freezer. Well, if it doesn't take as long. Um, but if we want to teach our brain what to put into the freezer, the only way we show our brain what to put in the freezer is by repeating it and repeating it. So this is the only way we know to get stuff into the freezer or long-term memory. So Irving House is a great um, helper here. But this is the fridge and freezer analogy. So we, we say to kids, now, when you learn something on day one, um, your brain pops it into what we call short-term memory. Now, short-term memory is the place where your brain very deliberately holds onto something for a minute or a, set, or a matter of seconds while you use it, and then if you don't reuse it, it dumps it. Um, if kids have had a psych, a psych evaluation, you will say when, uh, when the psychologist asked you to remember a set of numbers, they were checking how big your fridge is. And, and people with dyslexia typically have a pretty small fridge for what they hear. So it's also important to teach kids that it's auditory working memory or auditory short-term memory that suffers with dyslexia. So there's this whole kind of overarching teaching around memory. However, we talk to kids about putting things or taking things from the fridge where they go off quickly and putting them in the freezer. So repetition is the only way. And multi-sensory learning uh, supercharges that repetition. So yeah, the old uh, Sally Andrew from her training in the UK taught me the fridge-freezer um, analogy, and it is a cracker. Um, this is out of a, a, a course I do called Spelling the Playberry Way for Schools. But um, it is worth, this slide just, just reinforces, we've got to take the time to explain and then re-explain to kids that there are basically three memory systems at work in the brain. 
uh, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. And so we teach to all of them. We teach to all of those channels. Um, so if one of those memory systems can't recall something, another one flies in to back it up, hence the Superman um, metaphor down the bottom. So, yeah, it's, it's important to talk to kids about this um, and do it over and over again. Something else our kids really need to see is their progress. Um, I haven't, I'm not going to show a copy of my report for kids, but each year I will measure kids along a range of things. Non-word decoding, phonological awareness uh, using the, the levels on Kilpatrick's past, single word reading age, uh, passage reading, um, uh, the, the non-word reading I use is a single word assessment. So I assess on non-word reading, word reading, passage reading, comprehension, sometimes reading rate, but I tend to leave that alone because our kids will typically be slower readers. But this is a young fellow I worked with. I got Nick when he was um, a, a big boy. Um, and I was just showing Nick on this graph after he had a huge jump in non-word decoding score because we'd done so much work on sounding out and not guessing and we got some basic code into him in a good multi-sensory program. It was important for Nick to see um, just how quickly uh, he had progressed in his ability to sound out words he didn't know and it had happened in nine months because he was doing the work. His hard work and the practice with the program had made the difference. So our kids, we must not hide from them their progress. Now, not all of our kids are going to have these types of jumps, but our kids are used to not seeing progress. And if they do see progress, they can't put numbers to it. They can't quantify it. And the other thing is they just attribute it to luck. And our kids start to get the headset that if they've had progress, it'll disappear soon. Because dyslexia is just one of those things where you think you've got it and then you don't. Um, so it's worth showing kids this talk, sort of thing. And in the reports I send home at the end of every year, um, look, if they've had a flat year on, on, uh, on passage decoding, um, usually non-word decoding will show some jumps. Um, or their, you know, I say spelling too using, uh, using the Westwood. So across a, broader, a broad kind of um, assessment range, um, our kids will see something. They'll, they'll have something to hang their hat on. Now, early in the play, Barry, you know, it might be the first 12 months we only get some basic code into them, so we're not going to see huge jumps in passage reading, but we will see a decoding uh, jump. So um, our kids need to see progress. Show it to them. For the love of Pete, show it to them. Now, I'm about to get into some of the stuff we do, which, again, I think is therapeutic when we work with kids. Um, I guess the overarching mantra here is beware our kids watch us really closely when we work with them. They're often watching to see whether, we, whether we're exasperated, frustrated, angry, because don't forget, these kids came through early reading instruction with um, well-meaning adults and teachers not even knowing they're doing it, but perhaps sighing going, oh, why didn't you read that right this time? You decoded it on the last page or, you know, so they become ultra sensitive, I guess a bit like kids who have had abuse and neglect in their in their history um, become hypersensitive to mood and to people's reactions. And I know this isn't the same, it's probably a poor analogy, but our kids become hypersensitive to our behaviour whilst they are reading or spelling. So we've got to get really good at playing a very, very straight, relaxed bat when we work with them and perhaps becoming aware of some of our own glitches. So I'm going to go through something that a gorgeous kid called Eliza, and you'll see Eliza later. I worked with Eliza for years. Eliza's in her 20s now, a dyslexic kid. Eliza and I did a presentation for dys what was once Dyslexia South Australia, where we were teaching an, a room of adults on the emotional side of dyslexia. And we went through, what are some things you can say to our kids when they're just finding what we ask them to do hard? So I'll just go through them. Now, some of them won't need any explanation, but stuff like, look, mate, this is just your pesky dyslexia playing up. I'm not worried. I see this trouble. I see this type of issue every day, mate. Keep at it. Keep trying to sand out. You'll get it. Um, we see lots of clever mistakes with our kids. You know, Because our kids um, typically have strong, average or strong language, we might see um, a good guess at a word, but it was a, not a decoding guess, it was a context guess, and we might go, hey, lots of little clever kids would guess that for that word, but I want you to go back to your sounding out. I want you to sound that word out. We we'll just, hey, keep at it. You know, we learn, as you know, when our kids are having trouble decoding with a decode or an encode, 
they take time and sometimes they struggle and you just go hey listen keep at it you'll get it you know the sounds your brain is just taking a bit of time to mush them together or to unmush them just relax and we give them space to do it and if they really struggle we'll go all right this is this is this one here but they must uh, become comfortable with the time it can take and our kids rush and in our sessions we teach them not to rush um, You'll see a lot of our kids look away from the print. Well, we want them to decode. Our kids will look away. The gaze will go up and away and they'll look for the word elsewhere. And I'll go to them, hey, you, you won't see the word in my, my wrinkly old forehead. Uh, put your eyes back on the text, but don't worry. It's I'll say to kids, it's normal for your eyes to look away. That's a response to shame. And I get this from my restorative justice background. But teach kids that their brain... It's a very human tendency for the brain to want to look away from things that confuses it. So if we go, look, looking away is okay, but I want you to put your eyes back on the print and back to your decoding. Sometimes, don't worry, your brain's just muddled some sounds. Remember, that's the issue with dyslexia, muddled sounds. It has difficulty getting sounds on their own, mushing them back together, and sometimes uh, being able to manipulate them. Don't worry, that's dyslexia. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, when our kids get into syllable division uh, and morphology uh, after we teach them to decode, we need to remind them that we're teaching their brain to look at words in a new way that it's just not used to. Um, we're teaching them to we're teaching their brain to see parts of words, components of words, whether they're syllabic or morphological components, but they need to understand their brain wasn't used to doing this. So it's going to kick up. It's going to kick up a bit of a stink and have its little tanties. Uh, and that's why it feels really hard. Um, yeah, so your brain's learning to see things, words in a new way, and, and this is cracking the code, and it's hard. So stick with it. Um, yes, again, uh, saying to kids, you know, when they're fed up, you go, this feels yucky, doesn't it? And they go, yeah. And I go, it feels really hard, doesn't it? And they go, yeah. And I go, remember what I said to you when we first started, this is your brain making new connections. It will get easier with time. I promise. Uh, or the old, you know what? You weren't born knowing this, so hang in there. You know, it's a good saying for a lot of people. Um, Carol Dweck's work is really important. A lot of our kids will um, come from school knowing about things like the learning pit, um, and, and some won't, but if our kids have had any exposure to Carol Dweck's work, you just go, you know, dyslexic kids need to grow a growth mindset, I think, more than anyone does because this stuff is hard so i'll go you know you're you know you're a growth mindset growth mindset expert don't you um so also um the fact that kids working memories fill up really fast so our kids do forget the capitalization they do sometimes muddle on the upper 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 and lower case they forget to put full stops on and you just remind them do you know your brain has become completely chock-a-block with linking sounds to letters. Remember, your brain has trouble with sounds, so don't worry, we'll pick up that stuff in the editing. Um, I'm not mad at you that you forgot to put a capital there or a full stop there because, yeah, your, your brain filled up. Um, or don't panic, your brain sound recorder just ran out of memory. That's all right, give it a moment uh, and, and back to it. Our kids make lots of clever errors, particularly when spelling. Um, so, you know, if our kids make a mistake, you go, do you know what? All the smart kids make that mistake. Um, do you know what? Einstein, Da Vinci, Branson, you know, all the famous dyslexic folks probably felt just the way you feel right now. Uh, and on and on we go. You know, I, I will speed through these, um, but I, I want to share one that my mentor, Alison Playford, she's the play in the play, very taught me. She would say to kids, and I say when kids start with me, I go, do you know what? Even though it feels like we're starting from scratch here, you know a lot of these letters and sounds, but dyslexia muddles sounds. So this this is uh, about the unmuddling you. All mistakes are useful. A very important thing to say to kids. All mistakes are useful. In fact, if you're not making mistakes, I'm not um, getting good information on how I need to teach you. I talked about Eliza earlier. Um, I think all kids need to see the Behind the News Dyslexia story. And if you Google Behind the News Dyslexia, you'll see a great story that uh, Eliza and myself did with the BTN team. Going back shivers, probably the better part of 10 years ago now. But it is worth it. It is, a, it is an easy find. And Eliza was just fabulous in this. Um, Back to charting progress, that's just a snippet of the Playberry sequence. Um, in the front of the folders that the kids use with me, they have um, the Playberry structure from start to finish. 
and we highlight them off as we go. Just little things. Healthy competition. In my room, um, I have a chart that you can see there where kids, um, for their reading and spelling card drills and their concept card drills, sorry, their reading and concept card drills, they write their time down and kids hold records. Now, of course, some kids are naturally quicker, but I tell you what, um, the kids that do the homework, that do their cards every night at home, they are the kids that hold the records. And th those two youngsters there are awfully proud because they're taking someone's record and I took photos of them because sometimes I'll cheekily send a photo to the kid whose record they got and I'll go, you'd better watch out, mate. So-and-so's just grabbed your record at Teaching Point 18. So, you know, um, kids get the chance to set records at, very, at, at different spots um, in the program, um, but uh, they, they come to know that eventually some hard worker will come along and knock it off. So I want to finish with um, a recipe for success from Barbara Foster, which we, we show when we teach the teaching students with dyslexic course. Now, number one, we don't have much control over, but we all know if we, if we catch these kids, the younger the better. But then we prepare a marinade by mixing together a structured multisensory learning program. We take note of our kids' age, their ability, and their interests. So we've got to get to know our kids. Then we season with encouragement, humour, motivation, patience and enthusiasm according to taste. So again, that's a, <laughs> how much we praise kids depends on how comfortable they are with praise, but you know what, it's important to do it. Uh, and for a long-lasting flavour, we dip at frequent intervals. We, might, we may teach some of our kids some study skills as they get bigger, but usually in a structured synthetic phonics program, we're busy enough. And then we cook gently. You know, it takes a while, but we cook gently until confidence and ability have been restored. And then we let our kids loose on the world and, and we stand back and we stand by um, to back up, praise, but to be amazed because our kids are amazing. But one of my mantras in the Playberry is keep calm and reteach because it's just what we do. So a training I referred to earlier is this one in Adelaide on March 12th. Uh, teach them all as if they were dyslexic and you teach them all better. So if you go onto my website, you'll find how to book for that one. It'll be a full day of wonderful educators in schools who are teaching three tiers of intervention really, really nicely, uh, as well as me rabbiting on about uh, you know the comparisons between tier three and tier one teaching and why dyslexia has taught us how to teach all kids. And finally, uh, there's my website if you're interested. Um, some some plug some pluggy logos. Uh, teaching students with dyslexia is the training we use with teachers, where we teach them to use the Playberry Dyslexia Solutions multisensory program. Um, there's a word cracking training uh, for our morphology resource coming up uh, in February. So all on my website, and you can also follow me on Twitter if you dare, uh, and my face my business Facebook page is there as well. So listen, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've got something out of it.